Hello and welcome. I'm Imran Garda and you're in the stream. Today, a take on a global hacktivist movement from a former computer hacker, Kevin Mitnick, and racial inequality in the United States today and the legacy of civil rights leader Martin Luther King Jr. Our digital producer, Ahmed Shihabuddin, is uh, once again here looking out for all of your live feedback, which we'll get to in the not too distant future. Also on the couch next to Ahmed is uh, Maya Guarnieri, uh, who's an Israeli American journalist who focuses on news from the Palestinian territories. Uh, Maya, welcome to the stream. Uh, tell our viewers a little bit about you and, and the work that you do. Okay. Well, first, I want to thank you for having me. I'm happy to be here. Um, wow, I, I do a lot of different work yeah. focusing on Israel and the occupied Palestinian territories. But right now I'm working on a book about migrant workers in Israel, um, a, a topic that, you know, off, doesn't intuitively seem connected to the Palestinian struggle. Um, but, but it is because the migrant workers were brought in during the first intifada to replace Palestinian day laborers. So they've kind of become a, like stand in for some of the, you know, oppression you see that's directed towards Palestinians, it's also now directed towards this other group of others. Do you find that there's a lot of appetite in Israel itself to discuss issues of migrant workers? Um, actually, in the past couple of years, the topic has really come up because there was this plan to deport the children of the migrant workers, um, you know, along with their parents. And it became a really hot button issue in the past couple of years as, you know, the society kind of said, wow, what do we do with these kids? when it was, you know, they've been deporting people for a long time. And the idea in the early 2000s was to break up families. So they would deport the fathers, you know, and let the kind of mothers stay with the children. Um, but when they started talking about picking up children and throwing them back to a country they've never seen, mm. society said, whoa, what's going on here? Um, so I do think that there is some interest in the topic. But, you know, now the deportation has actually begun, and it's really the, the kids that are five and under, um, society's not paying as much attention for whatever reason, I guess because they're less integrated and so they're not really Israeli mm. children is what some people think. Yeah, lots of questions of identity in Israel on all levels. We look forward to uh, you chiming in on all our topics that we're covering and, and your thoughts in general. Once again, welcome to Thank the you. show, Maya. Well, you can tell us uh, what stories matter to you. You can just follow us on Twitter and uh, you can send uh, the hashtag, uh, send to the hashtag AJStream. That's our Twitter page over there. And of course, we could feature your suggestion in a future episode. Hi, I'm Salim Khan. I'm a journalist focused on innovation and news, and I'm in the stream. Now, computer hackers or hacktivists have been making headlines around the world for their attacks against banks, telecom companies and even Middle Eastern governments. Let's take a look at the latest video from Anonymous, which states their plans to, guess what, occupy Wall Street. Fellow citizens of the internet, we're Anonymous. On September 17th, Anonymous will flood into Lower Manhattan, set up tents, kitchens, peaceful barricades and occupy Wall Street for a few months. Once there, we shall incessantly repeat one simple demand in a plurality of voices. We want freedom. This is a non-violent protest. We do not encourage violence in any way. The abuse and corruption of corporations, banks and governments ends here. Join us. We are anonymous. We are legion. We do not forgive. We do not forget. Wall Street. Expect us. Fascinating. Of course, we've got those very dramatic masks reminiscent of that uh, film v, v for Vendetta, the Guy Fawkes uh, masks. Interesting to see how many people go. Of course, Anonymous is the same group that shuts down websites and releases confidential data to embarrass and discredit their targets. Many are wondering if there is a method or a sort of code of ethics to these movements. Well, joining us uh, to help us understand this is a man who was once the world's most notorious computer hacker. In the early 1990s, Kevin Mitnick hacked into government and corporate computer systems, stealing secrets and software while making a name for himself as a sort of cyber prankster. He was one of the FBI's most wanted criminals and eventually served five years in prison for his actions. Well, today he's sought after as a speaker and also as a consultant on computer and uh, information security. He's written a book as well. 
He writes about his exploits from his hacking days in a new book called Ghost in the Wires. This is it. Let me just zoom in a little bit so you can have a look. Give him a nice plug over there. Kevin Mitnick, Ghost in the Wires, My Adventures as the World's Most Wanted Hacker. Well, he joins us now from Las Vegas, Nevada. Kevin, welcome hey. to the stream. Uh, good to have you. I feel quite uh, privileged and honored to uh, have somebody on the program who was once on the FBI's most wanted list, and it's not Osama bin Laden or anybody affiliated to Al-Qaeda. Um, do you, when you look back at, at your, your life and your career, do you uh, look at it from the perspective of you were hacking for the bad guys and now you're hacking for the good guys? Well, I kind of look at, uh, look at my career as that I was like this... Um you know, this guy that had an extreme passion for technology, and I really pushed the envelope, and I got myself into a lot of hot water because my hacking was primarily intellectual pursuit. It was for intellectual challenge. It was for an adventure, and most importantly, the pursuit of knowledge. And that is what really drove me um, all my life. And even today, I hack, but I do it with permission. What about those who combine similar skills to yours, but add to it ideology, add to it an agenda, add to it political activism, those so-called hacktivists. Do you believe it's good or bad for society? Well, I don't think it's good to break into, uh, to break into companies and to break into sites to send a message. I mean, there's hackers that protest uh, on the street in legitimate protests because sometimes the victims in this case aren't really the targets, and there's more socially acceptable ways I think they could operate. And even, to, you know, it's getting to the point of like cyber extortion. Unless you do X, we're gonna do Y. So it gets, you know, it gets to the point where the line is being, you know, crossed even more. Is, it, into, is there anything, is there anything, sorry to interrupt you, is there anything worth hacking into? What do you mean by that? Is there any <laughs> cause? Do you, that, I mean, for example, creeping authoritarianism, perhaps, from a government. Is it not worth having people upsetting the social order in order to, you know, trigger change? Well, I don't know if it, you know, the, what's probably triggered change, at least with security, was, the, you know, the whole WikiLeaks saga. But I don't know if the a group Anonymous is really making changes worldwide. Of course, they're causing companies to be more concer concerned and do security audits prevent to prevent that from happening to them. But as far as worldwide change, I don't really see it. Kevin, you know, a lot of our online audience is asking questions around the issue of, I guess, ethics. You know, Debbie Jensen right here on Facebook saying, I just can't think how any hacking can be ethical. Sorry. So to you, when Anonymous, you know, hacks in with ideological reasons and then they release, you know, customer information, what's your take on that? Is well, I agree that that type of hacking is unethical, but I do ethical hacking all the time. And that's where companies hire me to try to break into their systems and their networks to find their holes so they could fix them before the bad guys get in. That is ethical. Uh, so hacking can be ethical or it could be, un it could be both ethical or, uneth or, or unethical. Hacking is a tool, and it could be used either way. But, but couldn't it be argued that hacking can be used as, as a fresh tool, of a uh, fresh form of social protest, you know, that the media maybe is not so keen to go cover some people standing with signs on a street corner, but, you know, hacking is a new, innovative way maybe to draw media attention to topics that, you know, I'm not advocating that they should be taking the information of innocence and putting it out there, but you know what I'm saying, that it could be used as a tool to draw attention to contemporary issues. Are you talking about setting up your own legitimate website and putting political messages on there or, or just attacking uh, some news organization like the New York Times and putting your message on their website? What, uh, what are you speaking to? Well, Which type of hack? As, 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 well, I guess more, more the latter. I mean, I, it's kind of that issue of, you know, if a tree falls in the woods, you know, and no one hears it, does it make a sound? And if people go stand on the street down here and, and no one sees them, but, you know, doing something visible like hacking the New York Times website, you know, that, that brings attention maybe to an issue that otherwise wouldn't get coverage. I mean, you know. Sure, I understand that point, but then, you know, that's committing a crime. So you're kind of right. advocating. Well, I'm not uh, advocating. I'm well, just playing uh, devil's advocate. Maya, I know, I, Maya, I know Haaretz has, has carried some of your writing. I'm not so sure the New York Times yeah. will <laughs> in the immediate yeah, future. <laughs> they just put me on their bestsellers list, so I'm happy yeah. with them. Kevin, oh, no. 
Kevin, Kevin, you spent some time in jail for your hacking, and you five you years and, and you didn't you didn't have a political it. message. Do you have deep regret over that? I mean, you know, the 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 cynic in me says, you know, hackers should be okay in jail because they're used to spending lots of time on their own, <laughs> uh, no girls around. Uh, no, I'm just joking. But do you have deep regrets over your time in jail? I have deep regrets for causing losses to the companies I hacked into because I was a really a big pain in the butt. And I especially feel regret for the, for the trauma I caused my family. Because as I was going through the, you know, the, uh, the federal criminal justice system, my family was really suffering. So I do have regrets. And uh, if I had a chance to do it over again, I would do it differently. And Kevin, you know, we have a tweet from Sundas Azim saying, but governments try shutting down hackers. So how does spying into personal data of millions of people not add up as hacking? In light of the Arab uh, uprisings we saw in, uh, you know, in Tunisia, in particular, targeted phishing operations where the government is presumably hacking. What's your take on that? Yeah, I, I believe that. I mean, I mean, all governments are involved in hacking one way or another. Look at Stuxnet. Now you have a sophisticated piece of malicious code that shuts down uh, an Iranian nuclear power plant. So governments are both working on the offensive and the defensive. Yeah, glad that you mentioned Stuxnet because um, many believe that that was probably uh, from uh, the Israelis, perhaps in conjunction with uh, you know the, the United States and hackers from within the U.S. Robert Gates very recently spoke of future cyber war. This was at a time when there was tension with, with China over issues of, of hacking and tension between the United States and China over Google and China, etc. Do you believe that hackers are more and more being used as tools by nation states that the, the guys who were the nerds sitting in their, in, in their dark rooms uh, not so long ago are being um, called into the debate far more when it comes to geopolitics and that they could play a crucial role uh, and make the difference between peace or war? Or is that far-fetched? Well, I believe you know, that hackers are definitely being recruited by at least the United States government. So I assume it's happening with other governments as well. There's a, a, a very large, or the largest hacker conference in Vegas called DEF CON, uh, which happens on an annual basis. They were out there intelligence agencies, U.S. intelligence agencies, were there trying to recruit hacking talent. So I think that answers the, uh, you know, some of your question there. Looking at LulzSec and Anonymous, how much manpower do you think they have? How many hackers do you think are involved? I, it's hard to tell. I think originally maybe it was a handful of people with both groups, but I think because of all the media attention that both groups are getting, a lot of you know, kids want to jump on the bandwagon because they think it's kind of cool. So what happens is you get less sophisticated attackers that are trying to break into targets like InfraGuard, and they're doing it from their dorm room, or they're doing it from their home, and then these kids are getting, obviously the FBI is easily identifying them, and they're, these are the kids that are getting indicted. I don't think the real players behind LulzSec and Anonymous, uh, you know, are the ones that are getting caught here. I think it's the people that are jumping on the bandwagon than the, you know, the other factions of Anonymous and LulzSec that are happening nowadays. Kevin, great pleasure having you on the program. Interesting choice of refrigerator magnets as well. I'm going to do a psychoanalysis of that to get into the That's mind of the hacker. That's why I travel. I travel around the world <laughs> speaking at conferences, so I always get a magnet at the airport. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> Kevin Mitnick, great pleasure having you on the stream. We hope to have you on the show again in the future. It was a pleasure. Thank you for having me. Well, there you have it, Kevin Mitnick uh, joining us. There. Now, don't forget, you can actually get more by going on to our website. More on a master hacker's take on hacktivism today. That's stream.aljazeera.com. You'll find videos, pictures, and far more in-depth information. The phrase Tal Amrak in Saudi Arabia literally translates into may God prolong your life. And it's used as a sign of respect when addressing royalty or influential businessmen in the Gulf region. But a new use of the expression in the form of a Twitter hashtag links to an outpouring of criticisms of the government from Saudi netizens and also across the wider Arab world who are claiming that the royal family ignores Saudi Arabia's poor and are suppressing the spirit of dissent in the region. Now from Saudi Arabia, we have a tweet from Nawara82 
who outlined the king's failure to usher in reforms he had promised since earlier this year. It says right here in English, this is our translation, you promised us progress and we found ourselves late. You promised us a decent life and we face high living expenses. You promised us the policy of, quote, the open door and gifted us the new anti-terror law. Now, of course, she's referring to the hashtag Saudi terror law, a proposed law that would make it easier for Saudi authorities to prosecute and issue harsher punishments for protesters and critics of the government. But it seems many are already losing patience with the promise for reforms, including Manal al-Sharif, who you can see right here uh, was one of the women who was arrested for defying a ban on female driving in Saudi Arabia earlier this year. It says, since your sons and daughters are 20 million, referring to the population of Saudi Arabia, and we export 9 billion barrels of oil per day, in which barrel do you think we should keep our patients? Now, Saudi Arabia has seen a series of sporadic protests in recent months in support, for example, of women's right to drive, and also against rising consumer prices. But many are worrying that the government will come after those who are using this very hashtag to criticize the country. Khadija al-Sheikh, as you can see right here, tweeted, the guy who started the hashtag, Tal Umrak, is probably tied up in a tinted GMC halfway to al rabah al-Khali desert. Presumably that would be the last time we hear of him. And then also Freedom Egypt saying, some Saudis are expressing fear of Twitter getting blocked in Saudi after Tal Umrak hashtag intensity. And lastly, we'll leave you with this photo, which was tweeted by Hassan in Saudi Arabia, right here behind me, who writes at the top, thank you for your attention. And the cartoon right there seemingly showing an uh, upper-class Saudi man asking one of the country's poor to, quote, donate to your Muslim brothers in Somalia. And in doing so, perhaps suggesting that the Saudi government neglects its own citizens, even as it comes to the aid of others uh, suffering in other countries. Now, We'll continue to follow this conversation online and this hashtag, but here are some other hashtags that we're following. This weekend, many Americans mark the anniversary of the March on Washington, where in 1963, hundreds of thousands of people marched for greater civil and economic rights for African Americans. Let's give you a bit of a taste and a bit of a reminder as to what happened. Well, you can see people marching there. Many remember the event as uh, the stage on which civil rights leader Martin Luther King Jr. delivered his historic I Have a Dream speech but it was officially called the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom, a theme which African-American activists say needs to be revisited. Unemployment for blacks is disproportionately higher. It's almost double the rate of white unemployment. Now, what is contributing to the increase in economic inequities amongst blacks, specifically in the United States? Well, joining us now to discuss this via Skype from New York is Mark Lamont Hill. He is an associate professor at Columbia University and uh, presenter for Black Enterprise Television. Mark, welcome to the stream. You know, I was looking online, looking, uh, going onto Twitter, onto Facebook, I found that the commemoration and the memorial for Dr. King was incredibly divisive. You had people sharing articles, for example, from Cornell West, uh, who said that uh, Martin Luther King Jr. would say that America needs a revolution, not a commemoration, and that he, he's crying, he's weeping in his grave at this moment in time. You had others saying that why should the United States focus specifically on the African-American community uh, when unemployment and um, economic issues and disparities are across the board, across all races? Uh, why do you think Dr. King's legacy is so divisive in contemporary America? Well, because Dr. King himself has become an open town in a time of war. You know, all political sides seize upon his legacy and his memory and his ostensible politics as a means by which to justify their own politics and their own position. So you have conservatives who will focus on Martin Luther King's famous line about judging people by the color of their skin and not the content of their character as a means to not talk about race-specific policies. You have other people who will appeal to Dr. King's notion, you know, that I've come to the nation's capital to cash a check. 
to talk about repar reparations for slavery. There are people who will use Martin Luther King to support welfare, to, to, to challenge welfare. I mean, Dr. King is a person who's, whose image and legacy has been used in all sorts of ways. And at some point, those things uh, bump heads. And, and, and we have to make tough decisions about what Dr. King really meant and who Dr. King really was. Uh, I suspect that if we were to subject him to any real scrutiny and his legacy to any real scrutiny, we'd come uh, to find out that all of us sort of have it wrong, that anyone who's in mainstream politics today is not living up to the legacy of Martin King. And that's why this monument is such a controversial and problematic thing. Looking at some of the stats, 40 percent of African-Americans, 40 percent of black kids are born into poor families. They are horrendous stats regarding the prison populations and the, the economic disparities. And then you have a president who's an African-American. Um, does Barack Obama carry the mantle, if you like? Is that too much of a yeah. responsibility on his shoulders? And is there too much pressure on him to deliver for African-Americans? Well, I think given the nature of representative democracy, I mean, it's always too much to expect a president to do all the work when you have, when you have a Congress and you also have a, a judicial branch. I mean, he can't do everything. However, the president does have a responsibility to speak to the most vulnerable people in the nation. And black people are overrepresented among the poor, overrepresented among dropouts, overrepresented among uh, prison inmates. And so President Obama has a responsibility to African-American people, not because he's black, but because black people are citizens and because they are, are owed what all citizens are owed. That's really the fundamental issue here. You know, uh, on that note, we have a tweet from Mayel Hassan just kind of commemorating him, perhaps, saying MLK's anti-Vietnam speech, his unrelenting, passionate commitment to America's forgotten poor is worth marching for, using a hashtag worth marching for. So I guess in the context of, you know, many Latinos and African Americans being, um, you know, uh, more poor than whites, what would you say? Do you think it's possible for African Americans to come together like they did in the 60s? Absolutely. I mean, I think what the, the, the key thing missing right now is people who are organized. You know, we have some activism, but we don't have enough organizing work. And we don't, we're not necessarily organized around the right things, and we're not necessarily having the right conversations. Our nation has shifted so far to the right, or, or at least the center, uh, and our economic policies and our vision of what it means to have a democracy is so contingent upon capitalism, it's so contingent upon markets, that there's no real solution that relies on the people or that relies on the government or relies on the public good. And so we really need to begin to organize and, and reimagine the questions, reimagine our strategies. And if we do that, we can win. The problem now is that every, people catching the most hell aren't the ones who are organized. Mm -hmm. I mean, you see, for example, in the United States, the Tea Party movement, which is a very effective movement, a grassroots conservative uh, movement. And whether or not we disagree, disagree with their politics, they're certainly organized and they're certainly, uh, at least on some level, grassroots. Uh, what I'd like to see is those very same movements occur from the left. And if we saw that, we could begin to see people come together, not just black people, but other people. The genius of King's legacy wasn't that he got black people in a room, but it was that he was able to have people not merely locked at the arm, but also locked at the circumstance, so that you had poor whites working with African-Americans. You had African-Americans. Mark, Mark, just as a, sorry to interrupt you, as a final question before the TV show actually comes to an end, you're going to stay with us for the post show for our online viewers. Just a question about some of the others in the civil rights movement, perhaps people like Malcolm X. Do you feel that perhaps in a way, when, when, when we look back on history, perhaps we, we, we give all the credit to Martin Luther King Jr. when we perhaps shouldn't? I, as a South African, I look at, for example, the issue of Nelson Mandela and the fact that everybody thinks it was Mandela only who right. got rid of apartheid and, and, and they forget people like Steve Bickle along the way. Is that a part of the argument as well? Oh, absolutely. I mean, Martin, Martin Luther King Jr. is the greatest political strategist we've probably ever seen. He's the, one of the greatest organizers, organizers we've ever seen in terms of mass action. But you don't have a Martin King if you don't have a Bayard Rustin, you know who was uh, a, a, a same gender loving black communist. You know, there are other people who made this movement happen. We need to not look for the next messiah if we're gonna follow the legacy of Dr. King. We don't need a singular charismatic leader. We need organizations of people coming together. And that's what King represents. The best of what happens when we all come okay. together and work and struggle and sacrifice. Okay, M Mark, stay with us because we're gonna continue this conversation in the post show. We'll get Maya's thoughts as well in the post show. Stream.aljazeera.com is where you can watch us. We'll see you next time.
Welcome back to the post show. We were just beginning to scratch the <laughs> surface of uh, this issue. This is always the case with television. Mark uh, Lamont Hill is still with us via Skype. And Maya, you, you wanted to chime in uh, at a specific point. I, I had to stop you because unfortunately we had run out of time. Do you find parallels with the United States and how it deals with its minorities? whether they're big minorities or small minorities, you know what I mean, and other places, like, for example, Israel, that you were mentioning earlier. Yeah, of course. I see a lot of parallels, you know, um, to Israel-Palestine as far as how the Israeli government, um, there, there's so much in place that, that keeps the Palestinian citizens of Israel from, you know, achieving as much as they could or going as far as they could. And, you know, a lot of it has to do with, um, you know, education. You know, we could go back to... The, the status of Arabic, how Arabic is not treated as well. And, you know, some of the movement, the resistance that we're seeing now organizing in the West Bank in particular, and these, it's a little different because they're not citizens of Israel, but some of the um, resistance we're seeing in the West Bank, they're comparing it to the Freedom Rides, and they're making those direct comparisons now to the African-American civil rights movement. Yeah. Ahmed, you've got some tweets. Definitely. Yeah, we, you know, yeah, it's fun. I, I saw that they were flooding in <laughs> while the discussion was. Yeah, ended. certainly. And a lot of people like you, uh, rightfully, I think, did make parallels or draw parallels to this being an ongoing problem. And, and, you know, to South Africa right here saying it's not only in the U.S., South Africa still, even after apartheid, has the same problem. But uh, right here, and this is a question to you, uh, he says it's on the black people to work in a community-based foundation. So kind of saying they should mobilize themselves. What's your take on that? Mark? Mark? I, I, didn't, I didn't hear the entire, you said it's on black people to work. I mean, In a community-based foundation. I, I think so. I mean, I think community-controlled organizations, community-controlled schools, grassroots organizations, they're all uh, necessary for getting this work done. But we can't forget that uh, African-American people are citizens. <laughs> And as a result, there, there is some level of government involvement needed. And, and it's a, it's a tightrope to walk. On the one hand, there's deep skepticism about the government's desire or ability to, to secure justice for vulnerable people, at the same time that you don't want to get engaged in, in, a, in a particular type of nationalism that almost uh, absolves the government of all responsibility and takes away our citizenship rights. I mean, the government owes us stuff, so to speak. Uh, we owe ourselves something, too, and I think striking that balance is critical. Mm -hmm. Mark, last year, uh, Glenn Beck tried to piggyback on <laughs> Martin Luther King's uh, oh, legacy yeah. on the anniversary of, I mean, this particular, the same anniversary that we're talking about now, so it's 48 years now, it was 47 years, he had his own uh, Tea Party rally, which he had spearheaded, and he said that Martin Luther King Jr.'s legacy is not for only African Americans or for racial minorities. It's for all Americans, but his legacy vindicates the Tea Party's agenda <laughs> and its <laughs> anti-government agenda. So this, I mean, this, this opens up a bit of a Pandora's box, does it not? Because you have people you would never, ever in a million years assume would relate with Martin Luther King trying to smuggle themselves into his legacy. How does that affect African Americans and how does that make you feel as an African American? Well, I, as someone who supports King's legacy, it's frustrating. African American or, or not, I mean, piggyback was a very generous term uh, <laughs> that you gave Jim uh, Glenn Beck. I, I'd say he simply was attempting to exploit it. Uh, one thing is true, though. Black people aren't the only ones who are entitled to Dr. King's legacy. Dr. King uh, fought for vulnerable people. He wanted to create a nation of justice and a nation of democracy. Uh, and that's not ex exclusive to African-American people. The key, though, is to read King closely. Again, if you reduce King to the speech he gave on August 28, 1963, when he talks about, uh, I have a dream that little black boys and, you know, black girls will sit together at the table of brotherhood, then it can become a very simple, superficial kind of multiculturalism that is all about race mutinous, meaning we don't talk about it, and color blindness, acting as if we don't see race. But if we, uh, if we were to extend that speech out, and we would hear Dr. King say the opposite of what folk like Glenn Beck are claiming. Dr. King was not a closet conservative. He was a radical. Dr. King in that speech says that the nation owes the Negro something. He talks about the Negro being on an, an island of despair amidst a vast ocean of wealth and poverty, he, uh, of vast extent of wealth and prosperity. He talks about the need for governments to intervene to, uh, to address what was done negatively. He said 
that, that the government has done something against the Negro for all this time and must do something special for the Negro. He says, I refuse to believe that the, that the great vaults of democracy could be empty. All of, the, all of this language is about the government responding to social misery through right. intervention, the exact opposite of what King, of, of what Glenn Beck says. King fought for public accommodations in 64. He fought for a Voting Rights Act in 65. He fought fought for federal intervention, which flies in the face of all, what all the all this stuff that these state statists are saying. All these people who are saying that the federal government should step back and let states' rights prevail. So King's legacy speaks for itself. The problem is we've truncated his legacy, we've truncated his vision, and we've selectively appropriated sound bites for the purpose of our own political agendas. Okay. But if we stretch okay, King Mark, out, I Mark, feel very confident that Glenn Beck cannot hang. Okay, Mark, let's bring Ahmed in here, and then we're going to give Maya a chance as well. Yeah, you know, lots of people tweeting in, as you imagine, race being a controversial topic still in America. The Assassin 36 saying, um, we live in a world where Beyonce, the pop star, being pregnant gets more light than an MLK memorial. So I think this is referring to yesterday's Video Music Awards where she revealed she was pregnant. And then quickly before you continue with that, I want your take on that though. We have sound migration saying, could we ask you about, again, what Imran mentioned, which is the exclusively white nature, as he puts it, of the Tea Party and the implications of that. Um, what's your response? Just briefly. Well Oh, I, I think um, a few things. One, I, I think that there has to be. It, and, well, let me let me say, speak to the last one first. The Tea Party is largely white, and it's a, it's a, because it, it's not just about fiscal responsibility. Everyone thinks the government should be fiscally responsible, even if we debate about what the details or what that looks like. But the Tea Party is also about white nationalism. The Tea Party is also about angst over losing our country, which becomes a certain kind of. Uh, a romanticism for the good old days. And for African-American people in America, <laughs> the good old days weren't so good. You know, things like slavery, legal segregation, Jim Crow, Jane Crow. So in many ways, you see angst about a black president. You see the, the, the frustration over America becoming more multicultural. And the Tea Party, while having some political principle to it, is also about those other things, and it gets really messy. Maya? Yeah, I just had a quick question. You mentioned wealth, and I'm wondering, you know, in the atmosphere today, you know, that, that march that Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. did wasn't just about race, it was also about jobs, you know? And if exactly. we, if we, you know, is there a potential, you, you talk about the need to get organized, and with, you know, unemployment rising today, with now we also have a large group of Latinos that are underrepresented politically, is there potential to get, you know, unemployed whites involved, understanding that they're kind of a, a victim of this, you know, elite white system um, yes. that it, it also victimizes whites if we can get a, a broader struggle, you know? I hope, I hope so. I mean, when, when the day Martin Luther King Jr. dies, uh, April 4th, 1968, you know, he had just, or, you know, he had just finished meeting with sanitation workers. He had just finished meeting with Chicano activists. He had just finished meeting with, uh, you know, striking uh, anti-Vietnam war activists. You know, his, his struggle wasn't exclusively race-based. It was always multicultural, it was always diverse, and it always cut across different issues. And so that's the same uh, strategy we need to deploy right now. That is to, to not just talk about race, but to cut across. And there's no one more vulnerable uh, to this kind of politics than white workers. I mean, mm. poor white workers need to be part of any activist struggle. They need to be part of any civil rights struggle because they're the ones who catch the most hell. But for them to buy into this, they have to almost divest themselves of whiteness. And I don't mean that they should pretend they're not white, but it means that they have to identify more with their class position and the poverty and the hell they're catching than the kind of benefits they get from being white in a country that's still racist. Mm -hmm. So that that's the, that's the struggle. That's why you have oftentimes poor the white people who are Republican who vote against welfare, who vote uh, for the Bush tax cuts. They vote for all these things that don't help them because in their mind, poverty is racialized. They think they're voting against poor black people when in fact, they're voting against themselves. Mm -hmm. Mark, you mentioned something interesting. You said that um, African-Americans should not receive special treatment because they're African-Americans. They should be you know, given full rights and full opportunity because they are citizens. But there are also issues of inequality with hundreds of thousands of people, not just hundreds of thousands, millions of people in the United States who are not citizens, mm -hmm. who come from south of the border. Mm -hmm. And then you also spoke about these statists, and you said, you know, these states want to go it alone. We've seen Alabama, we've seen Arizona, and their oh, yeah. immigration laws. Latinos in those states are frightened. Many are, are, are leaving in their droves because of these new, fairly draconian immigration laws. Cops can go up to them, say, show me your papers. You're not allowed to rent to them. 
kids can't go to the you know, public schools, etc. Um, is there not an opportunity for those who champion Dr. King's legacy to come to the defense of those Latinos who are being targeted, many undocumented migrants who are not in the United States to commit crime. They're in the United States for a better life and who actually contribute to uh, the economy. Well, absolutely. And, and I think, again, King had a vision for this. I mean, uh, King talked about the triplet of misery. He talked about racism, poverty, and militarism mm. and how those things are interconnected. If we were to think about that in the context of what you're raising, then we would not just ask the question, why are there immigrants in this country or why are there undocumented folk in this country? We'd ask, why are they coming to this country? Which means we'd have to look at trade policy. We'd have to look at things like NAFTA. We'd have to look at uh, a drug industry that we help to fund. We'd have to look at all the forces that push people who are south of the border across the border and into the United States first, because it's our econ exploitative economic policy that puts them there in the first place. And then we'd have to ask ourselves, what, what's the most humane and sensible policy based on what we're dealing with right now. And for once, George Bush had it right. He said, we need a sensible immigration policy. We need a guest worker program. We need an amnesty program. Mm -hmm. We need something to bring families back together again. There are a whole range of things that we can do to bring uh, this thing to a close. I think, sadly, the Obama administration hasn't done anything. They've complained about Arizona, which they should. They've complained about other states, which they should. But with absent, uh, absent something on the books that is different and substantive, then we, cre we create the context and the, and the space for individual, you know, rogue governors to do this kind of thing. So we need a new immigration right. policy on the books so that they're not illegals, even even technically, but rather they're people who are trying to, to, to Mark, have a different life and are supported by the United States government. Mark, unfortunately, we have uh, run out of time. You have eloquence oozing out of every uh, pore. Thank you very much. On, been, on that note, fantastic. someone from our audience, yeah. Sound Migration, saying you're the most eloquent speaker <laughs> on current state of U.S. society has heard in years. So That's probably my fantastic. brother or something. Mark <laughs> Lamont Hill, you've been uh, a great pleasure, uh, pleasure. on the show. Great to have you. Thanks a lot for getting across uh, uh, such a wide uh, range of, of thought in such a short space of time. Mark Lamont Hill joining us there. Maya. Thanks a lot. Thanks for having me. I hope you liked it. I hope you'll come back again. It's great. <laughs> Ahmed, as always, I'll see you tomorrow, I guess. Hope so. Thanks for watching. You can uh, watch a repeat of this on uh, YouTube and stream.aljazeera.com in a couple of hours if you, if you love us that much. If not, we'll see you tomorrow. Bye-bye.